Hello everyone. Glad to have you with us to share in the word and the spirit of God for this midweek service. I'm believing God to do great things, looking for God to move the church in a greater depth, a spiritual move of his anointing and power. I want us to be the most dynamic and the most effective that we possibly can be in these last days. I believe that we're on the last leg of the race. And I believe that we should put forth all the effort we possibly can and believe God for everything that we've trusted him for in the past and exceedingly greater things. I think we should raise the bar and I think we should have imaginations and dreams and hopes like never before. So I want you to agree with me and let's press on and believe God and trust him. The Lord has been moving. He's trying to do some things. He's trying to open up doors. He's trying to move us to a new level. And I believe if you'll agree with me and commit yourselves and say, God, whatever it takes, you can count on me. I believe you'll see great things taking place. Do like Isaiah said, Lord, here am I and send me. And so I just want to commend you for the things we've accomplished. But there's greater things that we must press on and do and, and obtain for the kingdom of God. I want to minister this, this evening out of the book of Philippians. I want you to look at one verse of scripture and read it with me, if you will. Turn in your Bibles to Philippians 1 and 21. It's a very familiar verse of scripture. But I want you to look at it with me tonight and I want us to ponder some things. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church of Philippi, and this is what he said to them. He said, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Father, let your divine anointing and spirit move on this message. Touch everyone who's watching my live stream, who's going to be watching this on recording from the YouTube. I pray, my Father, Hallelujah. I pray, Lord, that you'll move in our hearts and lives and challenge us. God, help us to be the most dynamic that we possibly can. Let hell take notice of the progress and the forward movement we're doing. That we're marching against the gates of hell and we're convinced, we are convinced thoroughly, totally persuaded that they cannot prevail against us and we're going to be victorious. And for what does it come from? Give you the praise of the Lord on the first. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul is writing the church of Philippi. And he, he makes a bold statement here. He said, I want it completely understood. I want no doubt, no misunderstanding. I want to confess to you that my goals, my aims, my aspirations, my desires, Everything that I treasure, all the things that I have obtained, everything that I ever hope to obtain, every vision, every scope of, of every quest that I have has one thing in common and one thing in focus on my crosshairs. And that is for me to live as Christ. That if as long as I got breath in this body, I'm going to commit everything I am for the glory of Christ and his kingdom. I'm going to surrender all of my strength, all of my wisdom, all of my talent, all of my ability, all of my waking hours, all the members of my body are for the glory of God and Christ and for the kingdom of heaven and winning souls of inspiring the body of Christ and the saints and letting them know that you must be in warfare and march on and preach the word of God and be trusting that God will see you through and make a way. For me to live is Christ, and outside of him is only one other thing. For me to die is gain. When I leave this world, I'm going to step into a new place. Oh, this mortal must take on immortality, he wrote. He said this corruption must take on incorruption. Flesh and blood, he wrote, that the church of Corinth cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And so he said, for as long as I'm alive, I'm going to be worshiping and praising and magnifying God, even with the scars in my body, even with the sufferings and the shipwrecks, even the fastings and the cold and the nakedness, even being forsaken by fellow brethren and by others, countrymen. It doesn't matter for me to live as Christ. I bear the marks of my body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I crucify it every day that I can be a vessel worthy and be found fit to be used for the kingdom of God. But when I leave when I take my last breath my gain is to be with him my death will be my gain I'll get to behold him in his glory and his power I'll get to hear him say well done thy good and faithful servant for me to leave this world is 
rejoicing. For me to leave this world is the end of my destiny and completion of everything God's called me to do. It's the blessed in the sight of the Lord to see the death of his saints. And so Paul added, makes this broad statement, this dynamic statement. For me to live is Christ, but for me to die is gain. Let me ask you a question. If you was in a prayer line and the Apostle Paul was conducting the service, if you was at an altar and you was weeping before God, and the Apostle Paul was a man who was going to lay hands on you and pray for you, if you met him in the marketplace or you met him on your job, if you met him going down the sidewalk in the city, if he come to your house to visit you with someone else, maybe your pastor, and Paul was to ask you this question, and the question would be this, what are you living for? What do you desire more than anything in your life? What is the one thing that you could say without a question or a doubt that, that I live for this one thing? What would be your answer? You see, we're living in a time when people are so, so deceived and blinded. There's such narcissism. There's so, so much lovers of self. There's so much deception and there's so much uh, uh, ungodliness and unrighteousness. Uh, so many things that are taking place. Uh, so much lethargy and apathy within the body of Christ. Uh, and the fire of God is lacking in many uh, congregations. Uh, and so you would be surprised at some of the answers. Uh, because you can uh, be honest and you might have an answer you wouldn't realize you was going to give. For some people, they want to live for pleasure. We're living in a pleasure-seeking culture and nature. All oh, this nation and these people in this, in this world, uh, they want pleasure. But I want you to know, pleasure has its price. Uh, Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, uh, 11 and 9 says this. Uh, because in pleasure, the, 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 I, 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 think about, I think about the prodigal son. Before I go to Ecclesiastes, I think about the prodigal son. The prodigal son said, you know what? I'm going to take my inheritance. I'm going to go to the far country and I'm going to live my righteous living I'm going to live for my pleasure. That's what he did. But the only problem with pleasure is that it is offered by the world. There's, the world, there's no doubt. It is offered by the world. It will present it to you. Ecclesiastes 11, 9. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. And let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth. And walk in the ways of thy heart and in the sight of thine eyes. You see, the world offers this. Listen, whatever feels good, whatever you want. Man, live the day for today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Let tomorrow take care of itself. The world will offer you pleasure. Yes, it will. But the problem is, is that pleasure, which is offered by the world, is temporary. Listen to the latter part of that ninth verse in Ecclesiastes 11. But thou know thou that all these things God will bring into thy judgment. He'll bring it into judgment. You can live a righteous life. You can live for pleasure. But there's consequences that's going to come. Hebrews 11 and 24 said by faith of Moses when he was come to, uh, 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 come to he, he Years of refusing to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Because in pleasure there is a season, but that season will end. And then there's going to be the judgment of God. Paul will ask you, What are you living for? Are you living for pleasure? Are you so blind and narrow minded that you live for pleasure? Some people are living for popularity. They want to be the one that's recognized, they want to be the one that gets the accolades, they want to be the one that's voted most popular. They want to be the one to say, you know, I'm here. And the popularity was the God of Pontius Pilate. In Matthew, he said, therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, who were you that I release on you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for that for him they had delivered him. And so what he was wanting was popularity. He presented them. He knew what they wanted. But he also knew who he should have released. He knew that Jesus was innocent. He knew that Barabbas was a murderer and convicted, and he was nothing but a, a scoundrel, but yet he wanted popularity, he wanted the people to look upon him, but oh, it's offered by the world, popularity is Mark 15 and 15, and so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus, who he scourged and to be crucified, and so the world will offer it to you, it will, it will, give it, it will be definitely offered, when you appease them and tickle their ears, but the problem is with popularity, but that's offered by the world is also temporary. Acts 12 and 20 and 23. Herod, when he was highly displeased with them, a 
I heard sight of them. But they came with one accord to him, having made gladness uh, the king's chamberlain, their friend desired peace, uh, because their country was nourished by the king's country. Uh, and upon a said day, here in arrayed in royal apparel, uh, sat upon his throne uh, and made an oration uh, unto them. Uh, and the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of, of a God and not a man. Uh, and the Bible said in the 23rd verse, uh, And immediately the angel of the Lord smote him, uh, because he gave God, not God, the glory, and he was eating up, wor eating up worms and gave up the ghost. Uh, so popularity in the world of opera, but it's temporary. It's temporary, just as pleasure is temporary. Some people live for possessions. If they would answer the Apostle Paul, they would say, well, my desire is to gain things in this world. I want lands, I want vehicles, I want possessions, I want things that I can hold in my hand. And they were the possessions of the God and the rich fuel, uh, rich fool in Luke 12 and 19. Because he said, to, I will say to my soul, Oh, so thou hast much good laid up for many years. Take thy ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And so the possessions of this life will, will deceive you and blind you. It'll crater you and rock you. It'll allow you to slumber in the midst of the ashes of the fire that's going to consume you without you even recognizing it. You'll be totally oblivious that judgment is on the horizon, that the coming of the Lord is coming, and you're not even aware of it. And so even though the world will offer to, and, and, and the possessions of this God will be presented. Uh, they're offered by the world. Yes, they are. Just as they offer the rich fool. Luke, Luke 12 and 16. And he spake a parable to them saying, uh, the ground of a certain rich man uh, brought forth plenty. And he, and he thought of himself saying, uh, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my goods. Uh, but God said unto him, thou fool, this night uh, thy soul shall be required of thee. Then those, who, those things that will be that was I had provided, who shall it be? Uh, listen, the possessions are temporary. Everything you have in this world, uh, I want to remind you, as I say many times, uh, naked you come into this world, uh, and naked you will leave. Uh, you can't take anything with you. Uh, you can take nothing with you. No, no. Uh, it was produced by the world, uh, and it's going to be left uh, at, with the world. Uh, and so possessions you might desire. You might want them more than anything, uh, but they are only temporary. And there's some people that live for philosophy. They get caught up in it. You see, the philosophy, that was the God of Epirocurus e e e e e e and the Sartes. Listen to what they said. And then certain philosophies of the e e e Epicureans and Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this blabber say? Others, some, he seemed to be a set of forth a strange God because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And, and they took him and brought him onto the uh, Arab Vegas, saying, May we know what is thy, this new doctrine where thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. And, and the uh, aliens and strangers were for there, spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. There's some people that are wrapped up in philosophy. They, they chase all these ideologies. They chase all these things theories and all these things that they got going on and they're wrapped up in philosophy but the problem with philosophy even though it's offered by the world beware lest any men spoil you through philosophy Colossians 2 and 8 and vain deceit after the tradition of men after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ philosophy will lead you away from Christ philosophy wants to show factual proof and not faith and not grace and not trust not believing and accepting the word of God Philosophy will lead you to an astray. It'll put you to see that you can never find the end thereof. You can never get the answer. I thank God that in the Word of God, He can bring peace and solace to my soul. I can have understanding and comprehension. He can give me wisdom and understanding beyond my ability. But in philosophy, you're dealt with what limitations you have in humanity and mind and experience and history and reflection. I'll 
this is philosophy it will be offered by the world, uh, but it's only temporary. That's all it is. Uh, philosophy is uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 1 19, for it is written, uh, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise uh, and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Uh, so philosophy will gain you nothing. Uh, it is only temporary. Is that what you're searching for? Is that what you're living for? Philosophy? Uh, is it something you want to gain more than anything in this world, uh, even though it's only temporary? Some people live for power. They like power. That was the thing with the, the God of Nimrod. In Genesis 10 and 8, the Bible says that, And Cush began Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord, wherefore it is said, Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the begin, beginning of his kingdom was Babel, and Eric, and Achan, and Kelnel, Kel in the land of Shinar. Listen, Nimrod established the first kingdom, but he also established the first false religion against God and, said, and, and sinned against all the things since the flood of Noah. He defied, defied God to send another flood. He built the tower of Babel. He dared God, send another flood. I'd be prepared. You see, he wanted power. And the power of that God uh, deceived him and blinded him. Uh, it's offered by the world in Daniel 4. In Daniel 4 and 30, the king spake said, It's not this great Babylon uh, that I built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. And Nebuchadnezzar was so blinded by power, by the accolades of man and all those that looked upon him uh, for the achievements that he had done. Uh, listen, what you gained and achieved in this world uh, is only made by the mercy and the grace of God. Uh, if you got talents because God bestowed it upon you. If you got wisdom because God bestowed it upon you. If you got beauty it's because God presented it unto you. I'm telling you everything you got comes from God. And all we get so blindsided that we think that it's all about us and what we've accomplished and what we've done. But no, it's all been by the mercy and the grace of God. And so Nebuchadnezzar was so deceived. The power which is offered by the world is temporary. This is what happened as you go down in the latter part of that fourth chapter. And while the word was in the king's mouth that fell a voice from heaven saying, O king, Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken of. The kingdom is, is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beast of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee until thou know the most high ruler the most high ruler in the kingdom of men, and give it to whom whosoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon them and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs were grown like eagles and feathers and his nails like birds claws. You see that's what takes place when you're deceived by the desire of power. The world giveth and the world taketh. Ah oh, you're a hero today and a zero tomorrow. And you better know that it's of no avail. It has no future, no eternal blessings of power. Does. But there's many that seek it. They'll cut anybody's back and stab them. They'll throw aside anyone they need you to step on them just to get a little farther up the chain and to be recognized and get a seat that they want to be in the position of authority. But all oh, listen, it all coming off to, even as it did for Nebuchadnezzar. Some people live for pride. Pride was the God of Lucifer, Isaiah 14 and 12. How are thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou come down to the ground which thou this week in the, the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will send into heaven, and I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will send upon the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Listen, pride is what happened to him. Oh, it was the God of Lucifer. He thought he could be greater than God himself. But it, it, and it's offered by the world. Listen to what he said in 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the eyes, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. The world offers it. It'll offer you things that make your eyes desire. It'll offer you things, my God, that you'll just uh, be hungry for, and your flesh will crave for, and you think you need it more than anything. It will offer you things that, that will lift you up in pride and arrogance until you don't need anybody, and you're better than everybody, and you're deceived to think you're it's so important that the world, the church, a, a society, your company cannot go on without you, that you're the main cog in the wheel. 
world. And without you, nothing can take place. But that's what pride deceives. And here's the consequences. Oh, it's the consequences. Now listen to what he said in Isaiah 25, because it's temporary. Isaiah 25 and 11. And he shall spread forth his hands in the midst of them. As he that swimmeth spreadeth forth his hands to swim. And he shall bring down their pride together with the spalls of their hands. And then Proverbs 16 and, uh, Proverbs 16 and 18. Uh, pride goes before destruction uh, and the Holy Spirit before a fall. Uh, and so in the conclusion, uh, what are you living for? Is it for uh, pleasure or popularity? Is it for possessions of this world? Is it for the philosophies that are thrown at you? Is it for power? Is it for pride? What are you living for? Everything in life, everything, listen to me, everything in life is temporary except Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. From everlasting to everlasting. Now, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall never pass away. The only thing that's not temporary is Jesus Christ. And that's what you want to focus on. You want to have the hunger and desire like Paul. And for me to live is Christ. And for me to die is gain. I'm not losing nothing to leave this world. It's nothing but heartache and sorrow of all unrighteous, ungodliness. Uh, it's nothing but tears and brokenness. Uh, oh, listen, for to me to leave this world uh, is to be separated from the sorrows and the, and, and, and the pains of death. Uh, but for me to be in Christ is eternal. Uh, and to be in Him is joy unspeakable. Uh, and to abide with Him forever and eternity. To worship and magnify Him. Hallelujah! And so you need to focus and ask yourself the question, if the Apostle Paul presented himself to you today, what are you living for? What are you living for? You need to answer that question. If you be honest, and if you look around and do a uh, evaluation, if, if, if you do an audit of your soul and your home and your life, your time, audit the time out of the week, the seven days, do an overview of what you do with your time and what's the most important thing. Ask yourself the question, what did I find more pleasure in than anything? What did I find more solace in than anything? And if it's not in the presence of God, if it's not in the Word of God, if it's not in the Spirit of God, if it's not in worshiping God, then you need to ask yourself the question, what am I really living for? What am I really living for? Oh, you better make sure you can say as Paul did, my life is for Christ because that's all that's going to matter. And if you can't say that, there's a verse of scripture that I love so much. I, I, I love and cherish this verse. 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you can't answer, answer that honestly, that your life is for Christ, then you've got idolatry in your heart. And you need to repent and ask God to forgive you and cleanse you. To refocus your vision. To help you lift up your sight onto the heavenly things, the invisible things. The things that are not tangible. The things that are the Spirit of God. And renew you again in His presence. And repent of it and He'll forgive you and cleanse you. And start you anew. Because all that matters is that you're ready to meet Him. You're destined. Everyone who's listening to me right now, you were born on a certain day, and there's a dash, and behind that dash is waiting for a day to be written in or stamped on, engraved in. It's your, the last day of your life. What matters is the time between the dash, between the beginning and the end. The dash is what means more than anything. What shall it accumulate? What shall it guard for your soul? What shall it benefit for the eternal things? What shall it do to enhance the kingdom of God in your life? Is it something that you can reflect on and say, I have no regret? Is it something you say, I wish I could have gave more for God? Or it will be the, the brokenness, oh, if I had only surrendered to him. The Apostle Paul would ask you, what are you living for? Lord, your answer be. Father, thank you that we can examine ourselves. And when we find ourselves short, 
When we find ourselves inadequate, when we find ourselves of missing the mark, struggling, sinning, being disobedient, fearful, doubtful, Lord, I'm glad we can call upon you out of sincerity and humility and ask you to forgive us and cleanse us no matter what it is. You're faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us. Hallelujah. You're such an awesome, merciful, loving God. And I praise you for it. I pray that everyone listening to this message will ask themselves that they get on the scales of the Word of God and see if they be wanting, to see if they're in need, or see if they're living a life of balance, a life of balance, of being submissive and obedient to the call in the kingdom of God and pleasing you. Lord, I pray that we'll examine ourselves and be assured because when that trump sounds, when that trump sounds of the death angel visits, there's no makeup. There's no second chance. It's over. And I pray that we'll be ready. God, we love and magnify you. Thank you for what you do, what you're going to do. We're believing for great things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Come Sunday. Come for Sunday school. Come for Sunday morning service. Don't allow the enemy to steal from you what God is trying to do. God bless you.